flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. Reckless speculation. Great talk. Juicy rumors. <laughs> yes. This is a Reckless Speculation Thursday. Happy Reckless Speculation Thursday to all who celebrate the lifestyle. Mackie and Judd, daily Minnesota sports entertainment, therapy, speculation. And uh, we're going to get our friend Darren Doogie Wolfson on the show later on. Usually we, we lead with him. He's kind of big-timing us. He's got Tracking. an interview with uh, with Rick Spielman that uh, apparently, you know, yeah. got to talk to Rick. I'm get, sure get, Rick's going to Rick's draft take. cut open a vein <laughs> on his draft day. You know, that ponder pick, let me talk about that. I was forced to do that. <laughs> Gun to the head. So, um, all right. The Twins are, what, 4-8. and eight. They're off to a terrible start. It's the second time they've gotten off to a terrible start in the last couple of years here. And so, yeah, I feel like to this point, everyone's just kind of either apathetic or like, yeah, it's fun that they signed Carlos Correa. They're off to a slow start, but whatever. The Wolves in the Wild are playing well, and the Vikings have a draft coming up. So, you know, uh, I think most people are just kind of like, until the Twins prove it and show me something, then maybe I'll start buying tickets or then maybe I'll, you know, start watching games on TV. Um, but we were on a text thread last night, and I'm just going to. I'm just going to give the floor to Judd here. It is a Reckless Speculation Thursday, and you have a couple times on the show and many more times off microphone brought the idea up about a certain specific assistant coach on the twin staff that is yeah. interesting. He's very interesting. So, um, I don't know. I'll just throw it to you. Are you going to fire Rocco now? or No, no. Tell the audience your theory here. Okay. So, my theory is this. The Twins in 2021 were a massive disappointment. And yes, you know, I know, folks, it's on the players, too. Oh, tell the players to play better. Okay, yeah, you're right. It's on the players. It's on Falvey. It's on Levine. But just to back up a little bit and sort of, like, paint a picture, there's usually one person who pays the price first. And it's not the GM, ordinarily. It's not the assistant GM. It's... Not the players. It's the manager. Now, when the Twins hired Jace Tingler, who I know was fired by the Padres, I know they had problems. I know that Jace Tingler, I don't even think he's highly regarded. But when the Twins hired him to be Rocco's bench coach, it struck me as interesting. Hmm, this is intriguing. The bench coach is a guy who months ago was in a dugout as a big league manager. Like, to dismiss that, oh, come on, Zolgad, typical, you're making stuff up. Hold on a second here, this guy was a manager, and he just got hired by the team, and my guess is it wasn't Rocco that made the first call. Hey, dude, you got to c- come here because I need a potential replacement because I'm really struggling. The other thing that, that, I heard, that I've heard and that I think we are seeing play out and gives justification to, to the fact that Rocco at times does struggle in-game with decisions is that his best ally was his first year, Derek Shelton, who got the Pirates job. Mm -hmm. But Derek Shelton was Rocco's initial bench coach. And what I've been told is that Derek Shelton in games just had a sense for what needed to be done and could basically tell Rocco, we need to do this now. Rocco, and this is not surprising, guys. This is not surprising. Rocco very much is a let's talk about it guy. Rocco is a, and, and, and this goes back to what I talked about in 19, and in some ways it's good. The zen of Rocco. Let's, let's sit here and light a candle, spiral light perhaps, and meditate. Hmm, what should I do? Should I go to the bullpen? Derek Shelton would be like, yes, do that now. Um, tragically, uh, D- David Bell, who replaced Shelty when he went to the Pirates, passed, and so Last year, the Twins didn't really have a bench coach. I, I think that old guy was his name, Bill Evers, helped Rocco out. But he, you know, anyway, long story short, didn't go well, did it? So I found it very intriguing, and I've continued to, that Jace Tingler, recent manager of the Padres, is sitting in the dugout alongside Rocco, seen as sort of a source of clarity on decisions. And with the way that the Twins are currently playing, if you dismiss, they're not going to make a change. It's only X amount of games in. There's two things to keep in mind. Number one is, no, it's not. 2021 is still going to be held against everybody, and especially Rocco. And the second thing is, Jace Tingler 
was a manager, not not an up and coming coach. He has managerial experience, decisions, and he was hired to sit by Rocco. I think to dismiss this is to again, and we do this way too much. It's true of fan base and media. We sometimes want to bury our heads in the sand and not realize that something might be at work here. So do you think oh, reckless speculation? <laughs> Just blow my eardrums off. Yeah, pow. Um, do you think I, I have some takes and some thoughts on this too, but do you think that the twins deliberately hired Jace Tingler because he has managerial experience in yes. case things went south? I think they hired him because he has experience, and I think that they realized that in-game, Rocco often, and look, this is, if you watch Twins games, this is not a shocker. In-game, Rocco, I think, struggles with making decisions as quickly, because in all sports, right, with Zim, same thing, you need to make a decision immediately, and and by the way, it ordinarily needs to be right. Um, So yes, I think it's no mistake that after a year of basically watching Rocco fly solo in decision making that the hire is not an up and coming guy, but an yeah. actual guy who's made these decisions in game. This is hard because I don't, I definitely don't want to be the show that 12 games into a baseball season that has 162 games on the schedule that we're going to sit here and put a, put a manager on the hot seat and, you know, all right, well, this is a slow start after the first two weeks. So start firing people. Like I, I don't, I don't want to do that whole thing, but if you flip it around and say, all right, like what? What is Rocco great at? Let's look at the body of work here. This is year four of him as the manager taking over Paul Molitor. You know, what is he great at? And and how have these three and you know, three full years in, in a partial season added up? And I think, you know, I say this all the time on the show, like your your primary job as a baseball manager, it's not like other sports. Like in basketball, you're drawing up plays out of the huddle. And last night, you know, if you guys watch the uh, the Boston or it was the um, uh, I'm spacing on the game now. I think it was Doc Rivers in the huddle last night, drawn up a play for Joel. Yeah, it was the Joel Embiid game winner. And like Doc Rivers is literally in the huddle, and ESPN's got the camera, or TNT or whatever the hell network it was on, and they're diagramming him like, okay, so you're gonna th- inbound it here, we're gonna do a back pick over here, and then you're gonna pin down, and Joel, you're gonna roll and curl to the corner, wide open three, and like, and boom, it, it, you drop a play, and your players run it. Like that doesn't exist in baseball. Like yes, there are some plays that are diagrammed and things and shifts and whatnot. But like your primary job as a manager is to create an environment that allows the players and the team to maximize their potential. And you do that through dissemination of scouting reports, making sure everyone has enough information and that they understand the information, that everyone's on the same page. You do it by managing injuries and ailments and lineup cards, team chemistry, bullpen management, right? Motivation throughout what winds up being an eight month season. Like, and a lot of these things are hard to quantify. And I think if you look at Rocco's four years, this is now the second borderline disastrous start in a row. I mean, it's, it's only 12 games, but a four and eight start to start the season in a weak division. Like guys, like they can't score runs. And then some of this is small sample size and they may snap out of it, but we've now had two back to back disastrous starts zero playoff wins in two trips to the playoffs despite having the greatest home run hitting team in baseball history in 2019 and they just didn't hit you have underachieving young players like Max Kepler and Miguel Sano I, you know Trevor Larnick off to another slow start after a pretty bad season it's a former first round pick he's 25 years old and he looks pretty clueless at the plate you know chemistry issues in the clubhouse last year with some of the vaccination stuff so all i'm saying is on one hand, it's probably too early to just fire a manager after the first two weeks of the season. But if you start to look at the body of work and what your job is as a manager, is he really elevating this team? Is he really a leader of men that's maximizing the Twins players and 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 team and getting the most out of them? And I would say probably not. I mean, we could talk about Jace Tingler, and I got some stuff on him too, but like, Body of work for Rocco has not been all that impressive. And I know they won some regular season games the first two years and they won a hundred games and set the home run record. But like a lot of other things just seem off to me with him. And I do, I, you know, I, if they, if they said tomorrow, listen, we're going to make a change. It's just not clicking. I don't know that I would have anything to fight that decision with. Like if you, you have to, you have to argue for Rocco. 
what would you argue? <laughs> you know, that's my, like for Ron Gardenhire, you would say, man, you know, he might be a little antiquated in his thinking, but like that dude can light a fire under a baseball team for at least the first seven or eight years. Paul Molitor, just a brilliant, genius baseball mind with all this credibility. Like, I don't know what the fight is for Rocco at this point if they keep losing games. I think, too, the, the biggest knock against him, and look, this is hard in baseball, and it's hard in life, too, is human element. He has, in my opinion, very small and doesn't know what to do in a human element side of the game. They, he got hired with his analytical background, right? Like, he, he's an analytical nerd. He looks at the spreadsheet. We've kind of even ri- ripped him a lot for that sometimes. But his human element, the gut check decision times, which, again, are hard. It's hard to quantify, and it's hard to project that on any manager, I think, in 2022 with the way baseball is heading. But he lacks that human element that when you need to make a decision, dude, what is it? It's not throwing Dobnak out in game two. It's not putting Cody Stashek into a situation where he's gonna where he's gonna be terrible. Like Barrios is chugging along through the, through the first game against the Astros. Oh, third time through the order. Well, yeah, we all know the third time through the order the hitters get better, but we have to pull him. The human side of that, I think, is what's gonna be his biggest downfall. And I, I think the question about that is an extremely intriguing because we don't know we don't know how how much he's executing the plan that that Falvey wants at times and the plan that he that he has full control on but that's an interesting one too Dex because that goes to my understanding of why Paul was fired in the first place was that they because he is as Phil said he's a brilliant baseball guy like I mean that guy is a baseball savant he can hey Paul what what ha- happened in in the second in that July nineteen seventy eight game oh yeah a guy tri- tripled and then the next guy doubled and it's just incredible but part of the reason why they fired Paul was because they felt like players right or wrong were a little bit intimidated because he, he was a Hall of Fame player. He didn't, I think he's a good guy, but I don't think they felt he necessarily identified with today's players as far as they're younger, they've got different thoughts. They're probably not baseball baseball guys like they were in Paul's days. Um, it felt like when Rocco got here that one of his greatest strengths was identifying with players. Days off, of course, you know, breather, of course. Yeah. Does, does and, he even do that really well, though? Well, I guess. here's the thing. I think... The first year or year plus, it worked. But the problem is this. There's probably somewhere in between where the Twins perceived Molitor to be and where Rocco is. Because I think once players know that they can push buttons and get what they want, you lose respect. So like like in 19, it might be like, you know what, Kep, take the day off. That's great. But then Kep's like, oh. And I'm just, this is an example. But I'm just saying, like if... A guy like Kepler's like, oh, I can do what I want basically here. Now you're losing some of that um, of that street cred probably. So, like, I think there's a lot of things at work here in trying to find the right person to manage and, to Declan's point, make decisions in-game. In and it's a very, if this makes sense, convoluted stew in getting it right. Yeah, and I think even, like, if you want to just zoom all the way out to 30,000 feet here and say, just go back to what is the manager supposed to do? And I think the, the the only thing that we can really quantify is like the bullpen decisions. If you bring a guy in and he gets shelled, like Declan referred to the Cody Stashak playoff game. Well, that was an easy first guess to me. Jose Brios was cruising through five innings against the Astros. Yes. Um, I pulled up the box score here. He had allowed two hits through five innings, one run, 75 okay. pitches. But because the spreadsheet tells you beep, burp, beep, burp, beep, burp, that you can't let him face the Astros for a third time through, we must now go to the bullpen, and Cody mm-hmm. Stashak comes in and gives up a decisive home run. Well, Human Element says, Jose Brios feels pretty damn comfortable. His stuff is electric, and the Astros are having a hard time squaring it up. I'd rather take my chances a third time through the order with electric Jose Brios then Cody Stashak's pulse racing out of his neck, pitching in the playoffs for basically the first or second time or whatever, right? Like, and and I mean that was a first guess. So so like Declan nailed it on that front. But from thirty thousand feet, when you look at and the Twins don't have a perfect roster, they're not the Dodgers. But when you look at the last couple seasons, is when you add up the sum of the parts, does it equal something that you would say, oh yeah, that that makes sense? Like they should definitely be you know, a combined whatever it is the last two seasons, like 20 games below 500 if you include the 4-8 and eight start. Yeah, they're just not a very good roster. I look at this roster and say it's not perfect, 
but should they be like 20 games below no. 500 since the start of last season? And they literally okay. can't hit right now. Yeah. Is that 100% the manager's fault? No, no. Like these dudes have to be professionals and go play baseball. But would somebody else, the question they have to ask, would somebody else, Jace Tingler or whoever else, be able to get more out of this collection? And I'll tell you, on your Jace Tingler theory, he had the Padres playing great baseball for a year and a half. They were uh, in the pandemic year. They went 37 and 23 in a tough division. They beat the Cardinals in the first round of the playoffs. So Jace Tingler actually has two more playoff wins than any other Twins manager does over the past 18 seasons. And then last year, they started 67 and 49. So again, he was maximizing a roster for the first year and a half. And then things absolutely collapsed down the stretch. Middle of August is when they just stopped winning games. They won like 12 games the rest of the year, starting on August 11th or something. Um, and I was doing some reading on what happened. And, and basically, the clubhouse just became kind of toxic. Machado and Tatis were bashing heads. Uh, guys were upset that the franchise was shopping Eric Hosmer because he's a clubhouse favorite. And uh, Padres ownership came out after the firing and said the clubhouse wasn't as professional as we would expect. And so like things derailed. But I mean, if, if you don't think Rocco is maximizing the potential of this team, not that it's all his fault, why would you not look at making a change at some point with all that you have riding Carlos Correa, maybe only for one year? Like you don't have time That's to mess thing. around for two months here. Right, and and you need to win, like j just from a perception standpoint. Like this is a competitive market. Like you can't continue to just be like, well, we tried. The thing, so the intriguing thing about this as well is Phil, what you brought up, because I think this can be directly tied to Rocco for sure, and that is the lack of development of players. There are variables here that I will say this: I don't know who to blame, like Bucks did. When Buxton doesn't play, like Buxton, he tweaks something. My knee hurts. Okay, cool, dude. Is it the training staff? Is it Falvey? Is it truly Rocco who says, then you ain't playing for four yeah, days or five no, days? No structural damage. Right. But I would like to know who is making that decision because I fundamentally disagree. Like it, And if that's if Rocco is putting his foot down, that's a problem. But let's just talk about the lack of development, too. Like at some point in time, so so we get a lot of pushback because all three of us, rightfully so, Miguel Sano drives us nuts because the guy has gone backwards. He came up in 15. He had an eye. The eye's gone. Don't know why. Um, but the comment that we get a lot, and it's, it's fair, is why don't you dump on Kepler more, which is incredibly fair. Max Kepler since 19 has, has become a massive disappointment. So when you look at that, that's got to come back at least largely to Rocco. Like at some, what's he not do? What are they not doing? They're changing hitting coaches. So it's not one guy. Um, they're playing them both a ton. So I guess my question is, one, what's the problem? Two, is it fixable? And three, if you believe that Sano and Kepler deserve to stay here and should not be moved, then what else can you change that can maximize them to get them back to a point of just at a base level being playable? Yeah, I think uh, that's that's fair on the Kepler front. I think I think part of the reason why I go at Sano is because I think people like it's twofold. Sano was always regarded as a franchise cornerstone prospect more than Kepler ever was, and so I think the expectation of Sano was higher than Kepler, and so that like that's one of the reasons. But number two, there's still a lot of people in the even in like the Twin Cities media that cover the team that like defend Sano at every corner because he gets hot for three weeks in June every year and hits some home runs like so so I, t I tend to fight that narrative but you're right I mean Max Kepler since the Bomba season of 2019 has been a joke he's been <laughs> terrible and he's I mean god the guy's gonna be 30 years old I mean it's kind of it's kind of just over like I don't you know he's it's not like he's 25 or 26 Max Kepler is 29 years old and you've signed him to this long-term contract. So yeah. So again, is it okay? Is it Rocco's fault that Max Kepler is not enough of a professional to carry over the 2019 season? No, but like could a manager or could a coaching staff do more to figure out how to unlock Max Kepler? That's what, I yeah, think probably exactly. maybe, you know, it's not cut and dry black and white, but yeah, that's a, it's a fair question to ask. Yeah. Hmm. 
I know you you've been dying to uh, tie the spiral comment back in with uh, your favorite candle company here too. So if listen, if your team is on a downward spiral, yep. or if you're just looking for a great gift for mom or for the wife, Judd yep. has the perfect gift for you. Because of course, Mom's Day comes up on May eighth, and you're saying to yourself, "I don't want to get something cliche, but I want to get something nice." And you know what, guys? You're also saying, "I'm lazy. I don't want to move. I don't want to have to like get in my car and drive around town and try and find." Okay, I got the answer for you. Our friends at Spiral Light Candles have candles beginning at fourteen bucks. I'm going to tell you right now, these things they make an entire house smell fantastic. Uh, orders of $50 or more ship for free. Made locally, shipped quickly. Spirallightcandles.com. You can't go wrong. I to- told you guys, uh, we got like four at the house last week. Dawn immediately ordered four more. She's like, they smell so good. They're so cool. We're going to get uh, four more. So your wife, your mom would absolutely love them. Spiral Light candles.com check them out and tell them that sports dad said this is the gift for mother's day boom by the by the way the twins you know if you think 90 wins is kind of a benchmark where you, you, know, you can probably get into the playoffs the expanded playoffs with fewer than 90 wins but like the 90 wins would say that you're a, a true contender you know if, uh, four and eight is not the end of the world but it means that you now need to go 86 and 64 the rest of the way if you want to win 90 games so the longer you wait to get your season going the more the math becomes hard we're sure. not in crisis panic mode yet but i think the questions that you and we are posing are very fair can i please though stop hearing well it's early in the season and it's cold outside everyone's it's cold. playing in it's cold for everybody it's cold for everyone. Exactly right. And and you are, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, after being shut out last night, you are entering today's game with a collective team batting average below 200. Mm-hmm. Okay? So don't give me this. I mean, they aren't playing in Alaska in the middle of a blizzard. Like, let's stop with the excuses, ladies and gentlemen. I'm tired of them. The more that we give teams excuses in, in this town, the more that we are not demanding that they actually do their job. This is embarrassing. This offense right now, there is no excuse why an offense that added Carlos Correa should be this bad. I don't care if it's 30 degrees all season long. Hit the damn baseball. We're so soft, man. Like I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say the publication, but there was definitely a story today about like the twins emergency catcher situation, if it ever came down to that. Like that's not what we should be talking about right now, okay? Like that's <laughs> just you know, also like whatever happened to some of these trade discussions. Dude, Dave St. Peter came out on I don't know if it was like WCCO or he came out first week of the season and said more moves are on the horizon. The team freaking president came out and said more moves are on the horizon. Well, might be time to pick up the phone again. <laughs> you know, you can't again. You can't. It, it, you can't just say, "Well, it's early." It's like, no, you guys are four and eight. Dude, turns four into and eight. four and nine. Could turn and into like you got to win. The the Oakland A's stripped everything down to the studs and looked like a triple A team. And I I told both of you, I said, this stupid team will still find a way to win eighty games. They're seven and six. The damn <laughs> Oakland A's are seven and six. Fifteen hundred fans, I believe, yes. in the Coliseum yesterday. Oh. oh. 1,500 fans. It's hilarious. Oh, Sad, gosh. but it's hilarious. Amazing. All right, do we have yeah. some old tweets exposed yes. here? All right, every yes, single is. week, Declan dives into the Internet archives and oh, finds yeah, old tweets to embarrass us. That's okay. Uh, it's okay. find it. Here we go. We'll just go with old tweets exposed. It is a Twins edition of old tweets exposed. Nice. I will say that at least. So um, went down to a little Miguel Sano Twitter archive, so... Just wanted to uh, to see what we had to say about Miguel Sano. We'll start with Bill Mackey. Okay. All right. Early in Sano's career, July 30th, 2015. Hell of a pick on the short hop by Sano at third base there. He seems yeah. to be really good at baseball. He was. The damnedest thing I've ever seen. Oh, I, I did. I, I, there you go. I did use there, the word stop. seems, too. You know, just, just oh, like the, the I couched there? it. You know, he Do you seems remember his at-bats? His at bats yeah. for his age at the time, I was like, "What the hell?" He's got an approach at the plate. He's taking good at bats. I do remember that. Yes, yes, I do. He was very good. The <laughs> in I just, I'm so, I'm just so. All right. I Twelve games. No. Twelve games. It's, it's still it's okay. a, no. It's been a career since then for him. Well, for him, I, yes. Yeah. Uh, for him, it's pretty good. 
All right, for Judd, I need to hear if there's some sarcasm in this tweet or not. Usually, I'm pretty good at seeing the shift sarcasm, but I don't think there's shift sarcasm in this tweet from Judd right, last season. It. Nice Herbeckian catch by Sano in foul territory. I'm telling you, he's oh, a yeah. better gloveman than hitter at this point. He's a butcher also still uh, at first base. In May of last year at first base, I thought he played well, and he made a catch going back, I think, at target field, which was a nice Herbeck-like catch. But yes, he's gone backwards there, too. Who was uh, correct. we had no a we, we had a double A play by play guy on one time? Was that about Miguel Sano? Who was the guy yeah. that said that he's a better third baseman than Brooks then, Robinson? Was that the, that was about new, Sano, right? I believe it was the voice of the New Britain Rockets, and he came on. And he's like, he's a better third. He's as good as Brooks, Brooks Robinson. That he was and kind I of an old I, school baseball guy who had seen yeah. Brooks Robinson. Yeah, I looked at Phil, and Phil looked at me, and we exchanged a knowing glance of BS meter going off the charts. <laughs> I wish Royce would have been there to hear that comment. Live. I think we pushed back it. a little bit too. I was like, wow, Brooks Robinson, man. I, I don't know about that. And he's like, <laughs> and he no, Sonny, I've seen them yeah. all. It's like, I, brother. Yep, what, he's what, Greg okay. Nettles. And what, like, what, like, when, okay, I'm going to go off again here. This is the same rant I went off on yesterday on Purple Daily. But, like, if you're just blowing smoke up people's asses and lying, or if you're only seeing players in, like, this positive light when that's not true, how are you serving the audience? You're not. Are you, like, like, you're, like, what, like, what are you doing? <laughs> you're serving your agenda and your friends. You're serving your friends. If you're friends with coaches and players, like, I've seen this. Then you're serving them. Then you're trying to share their message, and you're doing. And what's dangerous is if it comes from internally with the actual team, you as a fan know that what you're hearing is favorable on purpose. But when it comes from people who are supposedly outside said team, it's a little bit worse. But mm. I mean, I mean, look at ba Bally's is nothing more than aside from G Jim Pete for sure. But Bally's is largely from its play-by-play -play people an infomercial for th those teams. Like, you don't get... Like, the play-by-play -play guys are never going to give you the truth. Yeah, that's true. They'll, mm, that's they'll true. spin a yarn for you, but they're not going to give you the truth. Right. So, uh, all right. Oh, so, so the, I think Judd's the leader in the clubhouse here, just you know, raving about yeah, a, glo a, a, a I, glove that... I own it! I own it! <laughs> Before Sano got called up by me, May 3rd, oh, 2015, God, I just won with just guys won. like Adam Walker... And Adam Miguel Brent Sano Walker. mashing balls. Where do they fit in? With Oswaldo Arcia, Kenny Vargas, and Trevor Plouffe, I think. <laughs> Adam Brett Walker, last seen playing, I, if I'm not mistaken, for the Milwaukee Milkmen of yes. the American Association at at CHS when Rami, Phil, and I were there to do a show. I was at that game as well. Okay. Yes. And well, mashing. Okay, so yeah. he, I just pulled him up here. So Adam Brett Walker absolutely mashed for the milkmen in 2021 so he uh, he batted 320 with a 1000 ops 33 homers 101 rbis he also stole 24 bases definitely one of the best players in uh was it the the, the american association american the, association okay, it switched yeah. to the american association yeah. right stuff man he's still he's playing? currently he's currently in japan he plays for Really? Let's see here. He plays for uh, the Yomori Giants right now in All Japan. Right. Oh, that's He's a nice club. Seventeen games. <laughs> no, I'm so serious. Far. That's a nice. That's a that's a well established team. Good for him. I know he's batting two fifty. The season just started. 40, 40 at bats. He's batting uh, two fifty so far with five runs driven in. So nice, nice little, probably a nice little bump in pay there too. Going to Japan from and the Milkmen. You know. What a great name. <laughs> I hope they're still there because that's a great team name, Milwaukee yeah. Milkmen. So, all right. Well, we got that off our off our chest here. So, the speculation is that uh, Jace Tingler could be ready at any moment to, to take over rec the reins. <laughs> They're gonna go out there, Jace. We we need the right hander. <laughs> yeah. So Rocco goes out to make a pitching change, and behind him is Derek Falvey saying, "No, we're actually gonna go to the. I got we're, gonna, we're going to the managerial bullpen. All right. We're gonna take a minute here and get our guy Darren Doogie Wolfson in for some inside information about your favorite Minnesota sports teams. Happy Reckless Speculation Thursday.